So here we are at Matthew 15, which uh, brings us, I haven't paid a lot of attention to mountains, but I've mentioned them a couple times. I've paid more attention to discourses. How many discourses are there in the book of Matthew? Five, right? Which is good because that's an odd number, and why is that good? Because the middle one then would hold the central idea of what those five discourses are. Uh, I've mentioned it, and I'm not going to belabor this point. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. But there are seven mountains that Jesus climbs in the course of this book. Did I mention that before? I think I did. If I haven't, there are seven <laughs> mountains that Jesus climbs. And they're throughout the book. And they are spread out. And this is the fourth of seven mountains. What does that mean? Seven is an odd number, so that means there is a middle. What's the middle if you're at seven? Three on each side, and number four is in the middle. So this mountain that we are about to climb, it's, uh, it's not at the beginning of the chapter. You may not have even noticed it, but it's in verse 29. Having gone up on the mountain, you see that? And it leads us into the last two events in this chapter. This is the fourth of seven mountains, which is the middle. And if this chiastic structure thing is a thing at all, we would expect this to have some significance or something to it. Um, interestingly enough, if you go back into the Greek and count the number of words that are used in the entire book and split it in half, the midpoint, where do you think that would land you? Just a guess? At the fourth mountain. It's precisely the middle of the book. And it's precisely the middle mountain. Now, whether that's really a thing or not, I'm going to let you wrestle with that. I've seen it enough in enough uh, con different contexts that I believe there's something to it. But I'm not going to belabor that point. Uh, we will mention it as we get to the end, though, because I think there may be something significant about that. Uh, those last two events that happen on that fourth mountain. So, let's start. Matthew 15, and let's start all the way at the beginning. Verse 1. And it's all about cleaning up before you come down for dinner, right? Did uh, the voice of your mother or father ring true in your ear when you read this? Make sure you wash up before you come down. And how many of you never did, right? I never, well, I pretended like I did sometimes. Um, so there's a discussion and the Pharisees and the scribes raise this concern about what is going on with Jesus's disciples. They're not washing their hands before they eat bread. And it's important to note that this is a requirement of the elders. It's a tradition and there's absolutely nothing found in the law regarding this. This is something that has been made up after the fact. When was this made up? Well, it began, it started this rabbinical commentary of what does that scripture mean, which leads to this practice, which leads to another practice and another practice. This began during the exile period in Babylon when they had been removed from their land as a consequence of behavior and while they're in exile, they begin to ask the question of themselves as a people, why is it that we're in exile? How did we end up here? And so different rabbis, different teachers began to look into the situation and come up with theories as to how they would interpret different things that were going on based on what the text said. And then they would come up with their opinion as to, well, the text says this, so to follow the Sabbath, that's what the text says, we weren't doing these sort of things, so I would propose we have rules like this that allow us to follow the Sabbath, if and when we get back into the land especially. So these books began to be gathered, uh, they're called the Mishnah or the Talmud, a couple different, uh, several different versions of, uh, of those rabbinical uh, readings and writings. And so we're not dealing with God's law here. We're, we're dealing strictly with man's interpretation and tradition. 
And it's that that Jesus speaks to when he answers their charge in verse 3. Uh, he goes right to the heart of the issue. And they had set up this tradition. The, this might have been a little bit confusing. There may have been one or two points missing um, because we're not in that culture. So evidently they had set up this tradition that says, hey, if your parents come to you and ask for some help in their old age because whatever it is they tried to do didn't work out well, we do have this commandment that you need to honor your mother and father, and that includes supporting them in their old age if they need it, if you're able to. But there became a tradition, evidently, that if I gave the money that I would have used to help out my parents, uh, gave it to the temple, to the ministry of the temple in some way, that I could then say to my parents when they came to me, sorry, any money that I would have given to you I have donated to the Lord. And then the tradition allowed a person to get out of that commandment of honoring your father and mother in that way and allowed them to sidestep it. Does that make sense? So Jesus is, brings up this example when they bring up the example of not washing. It's another one that fits into the same category. Um, it's a tradition. They had become so loyal to their traditions that they had failed, at least in this instance, and I suspect in many more, they'd failed to comprehend anymore what the commandments of God were, let alone follow them, right? And it's interesting because I suspect that every age throughout time has dealt with something very similar, maybe not to this extent, but would you agree that even today we in the church have traditions? Are now our, our, I'll ask you a loaded question. Are our traditions good? Well, it's loaded, right? Could you say yes to that question? Yeah, there are some traditions that are really good. And we should, we should uh, consider them when we consider what it means to come together as part of the church. But can traditions be bad? Yeah, so what's the distinguishing factor? The distinguishing factor is if the tradition leads you closer to the, whatever the heart of God is on a topic, that may be a good tradition that leads you to an obedient lifestyle. But if your tradition, no matter what your tradition is, causes you in some way or another to go further away from whatever the heart of God is on that issue, then that can be a very damaging tradition. And so I would just toss that out to you, not just because we're all in one church here, but you come with traditions from other churches. You have traditions from your family about how to worship God. And it's a good process to go through your traditions and always line them up with, what does scripture say about this? And is this tradition that I have leading me closer to God and my understanding of who he is? Or is it leading my heart away? Right? Good questions to ask. So, that leads to this question in verse 10. What defiles a man? And Jesus gives what ends up, we find out, is a parable. We know that because down here in verse 15, it says explain the parable to us, right? So this may be the shortest parable that we've ever seen. But Jesus said to a crowd that has gathered, hear and understand. Now he's going back up to the original argument of the not washing hands with bread in this example, in this parable as well. It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. So the mouth has become an outward sign of defilement. Now what do I mean by that? What is defilement? Let's answer that question. What does it mean when something is defiled? It's not in the correct relationship with God's standard of purity, okay? That could be a number of different issues. But in the Old Testament, the shadow of defilement, the, the type set up to show and exhibit defilement was when something unclean touched your mouth, that defiled you as a person. Okay, you as a whole. 
the mouth was the outward sign. Something that happened at the mouth was this place. That was the sign of external defilement. And that was just a picture. What is a picture of? It's a picture of something that's happening in the unseen world. Defilement isn't something that happens on the exterior of our body. This is what Jesus goes to explain. Defilement is something that happens on the inside. But it's still the mouth that is the thing that tells us whether you're defiled or not. It's not the thing going in. Mark does a really good job in Mark chapter 7. I'll turn there real quick. He said to them, you are lacking in, um, lacking in understanding. Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from the outside cannot defile him? Listen to the reasoning here in verse 19. Because it does not go into his what? His heart. Mark adds that. It does not go into his heart, but into his stomach, and it's eliminated. It's just a pass-through. That's not a course of defilement. The point was always, coming out of the Old Testament, that's just a picture that defilement is a thing. It's an actual thing that God cares about. So I'll give you a visual picture of defilement with some rules, but that isn't really the thing. That's just a picture of what you can't see. A person's heart that's defiled. And in reality, what happens? It's what comes from the heart that escapes out of the mouth that is the tell, then, of the condition of a person's soul. I want you to think about yourself for a second. When is it that you sort of let your mouth get away from you? There's a number of different ways that can happen, isn't there? I have one famous episode from when my kids were little. It has to do with a sports um, situation where I became a little agitated. <laughs> I had a few words with a very kind referee. Um, and it's not my proudest moment. <laughs> but I came out of that episode knowing, because of what came out of my mouth, that I had issues where? <laughs> In my heart. And it's the heart that God cares about the most. What else comes out of our mouth? Well, there's a lot of things that come out of our mouth. We can gossip with our mouth, untrue things. We get a list a little bit later on that we'll talk about. I want you to just think about your own situation a little bit. Don't let this just be an academic endeavor where we read about those poor people in the biblical times and never really make it to our own life situation. Where is it that you get into trouble, where your mouth gets you into trouble? What types of situations? And don't view that as a Debbie Downer type thing, right? Oh, poor you. Think of that as an opportunity of what? An opportunity to invite God into that situation in your life and say, you know what? I need some help here. <laughs> it's not going well on my own, right? So Jesus talks about this mouth and he says, you know, the understanding coming out of the Old Testament where it was something defiled that touched you and that defiled you, that was just a type. That was a picture of really the, what represents the heart. And we can see what comes out of the mouth. That is really the defilement. That's the tell of defilement. Um, so defilement's a thing. In Luke, we talked about this earlier when we talked about baptism earlier in the book of Matthew, but in Luke 11, verse 37, we have this situation where Jesus is having a meal with uh, some Pharisees. And he's reclining at the table. And when the Pharisees saw that it surprised him, he had not first, it says here again, ceremonially washed before the meal. What does that literally say? Do you remember? The word's baptized. It's really, literally, that he had not baptized himself before breakfast is out of the Greek. Um, this is an issue that they had brought up multiple times. This tradition of cleansing, uh, cleansing before a meal. And what is Jesus' response here? I think it's a good tell. It, it further expounds our understanding of our Matthew passage. It says, You Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but inside of you, you are full of robbery and wickedness. You're removing all the things out of the type, out of the shadow that would be defiling, but you're neglecting the true picture of the heart. Your hearts are defiled. 
but you're following all the other rules, and you've chosen the wrong rules, <laughs> right? You're following the traditions of men over uh, the commandments of God. So uh, we move on, and one of the things Matthew does is he starts connecting Jesus with Elijah's ministry. And in your lesson, I had you go back. We had you go back into the story in 1 Kings, right? And we had you try and piece together some connections. Let me, uh, I, I trust that you did that well, but let me just short, do a short, nice recap of that. Uh, in the 1 Kings 17 passage, God sends food to Elijah first through ravens. What do we know about ravens? They're black, they're birds. In the clean, unclean realm of things, they are dirty, they are unclean. So whatever a raven, whatever food a raven brings to you in the old administration, what would that food do to you if you ate it? It would defile you, right? So Elijah is in this, but God is saying, ravens are gonna bring your food and eat it. So evidently, whatever God declares is unclean, is unclean and whatever God declares is clean is clean coming out of this passage he goes from the raven to a woman and who is the woman she is from Sidon okay and he eats from the hand of an unclean woman not a Jewish person and she feeds him but she is a woman of faith and God knows that and God says this is fine. Go ahead and eat. And he does. Breaking rules, but God says it's okay. So then what God has pronounced as clean is clean. This woman has a son in need of ministry. Do you remember that? He actually dies. And Elijah brings the son back to life. So you have a woman from Sidon with a son that needs some ministry from a prophet of God. Now in Jesus, in the story in Matthew, Jesus, after having this discussion with the Pharisees about what defiles a man in food, he, uh, he visits a Syrophoenician woman, a Canaanite woman from Sidon. And the woman has not a son, but he has, she has a daughter. And that daughter is in need of ministry, right? And we're, you're to understand, um, coming out of this lesson, and I hope you do more easily, having gone back to the King's Passage, but you are to understand that when Matthew shares this story, when Jesus goes to this place and does this thing, he is connecting himself, and so is Matthew by telling the story, he's connecting himself with the ministry of Elijah out of the Old Testament. Okay? Others recognize this as well. We'll get to this next week, but in uh, chapter 16, verse 14, when Jesus is saying, who do you say that I am eventually? Uh, who do people say that I am is the first question. And some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah. Well, how'd they come to the conclusion that Jesus is Elijah? It's because he's doing some of the things that Elijah did. His ministry is reminiscent of the ministry of Elijah. So people are making that connection as they hear the stories about who Jesus is and what he's doing. So let's talk about this Syrophoenician woman. Um, it's, it's kind of an interesting story. It follows up on the previous topic. So we're not just moving on and starting fresh. We're actually following up on this whole defilement issue and what comes out of the mouth, right? And uh, it is the relationship De further defining relationships between Jews and Gentiles. In the Old Testament, Jews were considered clean from their perspective, and all of the Gentile world was considered defiled. And so if a Jew came in contact externally with a Gentile, they would be considered defiled, and they have to go through a process of spiritual cleansing at the temple, okay? So coming out of the Old Testament, that's just a external picture of an internal truth that there are people from the inside that are clean through faith and some that are defiled through a lack of faith okay and here we start to make that transition from the old paradigm to the new one and it's got some 
it's got some cool things that uh, Jesus does here. Um, interestingly enough, Matthew makes this story more about uh, the disciples than really the woman herself. I'm going to point that out in a couple. How did I land there? Well, if you read the same story out of Mark, it's in Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 24. If you read through this entire version of the story, the disciples are not mentioned once in Mark's version of this exact same story. So when you get to Matthew, Matthew made it a conscious choice when he wrote his gospel to include the disciples. And I'm going to suggest to you that really the message being taught or the lesson being taught is a lesson not to this woman. This woman knew, knew who she was. She knew what it meant to have faith. And she knew what that uh, allowed her to call herself. It's the disciples that needed to learn the lesson as to who this woman was. And I'll point that out as we go. In Matthew 15, 23, let's go there. The woman begs for the healing of her daughter. What does she say? Uh, it says, uh, uh, he did, oh, right before that. Notice how she uh, frames her, her request. Canaanite woman from the region came out and began to cry out saying, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. What does she call Jesus? Calls him Lord, which in and of itself isn't necessarily a deity type word or something that would uh, say that she understands who he is. But when she uses the term son of David as a Canaanite woman, you got to understand most Canaanites didn't care about the line of David or the tribes of Israel at all. So for her to be using that title on this person shows that she not only understands a context, but she also has a faith that puts Jesus within that context and she's willing to address him that way. So she's saying, Lord, son of David, my daughter is cruelly demon possessed. Now notice what the next verse says. But he did not answer her a word. Mark says she was continually saying this. And you get from the disciples' response a little bit later uh, coming up is that she was repeating herself over and over again and becoming kind of a nuisance. But Jesus doesn't say a word. Did anybody find that kind of curious? Did you talk about that in your lesson at all or in your discussion groups? I'm going to propose to you that whenever you read Jesus acting like what seems to be out of character for him, doesn't it seem like if somebody comes and addresses him with a, a right title, a, a woman that we later find out is a woman of faith, great faith, and she has a need and she puts her petition on the table, doesn't it seem like Jesus would want to answer her? Haven't we come to know this about our Savior through the, through the previous examples of healing? And yet, it says here that Jesus did not answer her a word. And so whenever you read something that seems to be out of character for Jesus, I would suggest to you that there's about to be an important lesson that comes out of that behavior. So keep your eyes open. Be looking for something, because when he says si stay silent, when he has the opportunity and it's more in his character to say something, there's something else going on there, right? Well, let's find out what it is. In this case, Jesus' silent gives space for the mouths of whom to speak. Well, who is it? He does not answer a word, and his disciples came and said what? They implored him, saying, send her away, because she is shouting at us. She is shouting at us, send her away. Let me ask you a simple question, a simple yet important question. When the disciples say, send her away, what are they really saying? I don't know if you thought about that. Here we are in a land outside Israel with a Canaanite woman. You've got to put yourself in the place of a Jewish person in that time and era. There's a Canaanite woman. No matter what she's calling Jesus, she's becoming a nuisance and a bother. And their response is, send her away. 
I would suggest to you, well, let, let me just wait on that. Let's go back up a little bit because I skipped over something that I think needs to be reviewed. In this, the tail end of this last section where Jesus is explaining the parable, remember the parable that I showed you? It says to the disciples, are you still lacking in understanding? Don't you understand everything that goes into the mouth? And he has this whole discussion. But then in 19, notice what he says. For out of the heart come, and then he has this list. And we know this list is Matthew's list. How do we know that? What's the other gospel that has this story? Mark. Mark has 13 things in his list, and they're in a different order. Okay? Matthew shortens the list and puts it in his own order. He has the license to do that. Jesus still said these things. But he has the license to do it for his purposes within his gospel. And it says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses. What's that? Lying. And slanders. What's a slander? I had to look it up. It seems like I wouldn't have to in our culture today. <laughs> slander is when someone makes a false statement that damages a person's reputation. It can be verbal, it can be written, it can be a number of different ways. Now, Jesus had just explained the parable about what comes out of the heart, comes out the mouth, and that's what is the telltale sign of a defiled heart. He tells that to his disciples. He then goes, and there's this woman that's just chitter-chatter, chitter-chatter, calls him Lord, begs for, begs a petition that he, she puts on the table, and Jesus doesn't say a word to her. And he gives his disciples a chance to speak. And what do they say? Send her away. And in saying send her away, what are they saying? This is a woman that is not worthy of spending time with the Savior. Because of where she is, because of who her parents were, because of where she grew up, she is not worthy of time with our Savior. That's what the disciples are saying when they say, send her away. Now, if I say to, about someone, they are of the character and quality that don't deserve something. What does that sound like? Slander? Is that a false statement? Is that an evil thought? By staying silent, what is Jesus doing? He, let me ask you this. Does Jesus know the condition of this woman's heart? <laughs> Yes, we know that from the banter that's coming up. It's a fun banter, and if you read it that way, it's a fun banter. That's why I'm going to propose to you. Jesus already knows the condition of this woman's heart. Who is he, what heart condition is he working on right here? His disciples. He stays silent with a petition brought before him because he wants the evil intent out of the heart of his disciples to come through the mouth and show that they still have work that needs to be done. That there's something in their heart even still. There's a defilement there that needs a savior. But they say send her away. And so Mark also has a kind of an interesting discussion when Jesus starts this playful back and forth. And I'm going to suggest to you it's playful because Jesus knows her condition, the condition of her heart. He has this discussion with the woman where he says the things that the disciples are thinking. Let me say that again. Jesus, in this discussion, is saying all the things that the disciples are thinking. Let me show you what he says. He says, first, for it's, uh, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I, my ministry, my Savior's ministry, the disciples are thinking, was not to this area. You're not worthy. It's to those people that live down there that had the right parents and the right descendants and the, the history of the faith. Those are the people that he was sent to. So he plays along and he says that. I'm only sent to them. And then 
he goes on to say, what, um, she comes and bows down before him in verse 25. Let me get that to the top of the screen. Lord, help me. And then he says, it's not good. He, he's still in this banter. He's still saying all the things that the disciples are thinking. It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Who's he calling her? Who are the disciples calling her? They think she's a dog, which is an unclean animal, right? Uh, Mark, on the same point, adds to the beginning of that statement, let the children be satisfied first. Meaning, the people that live in Israel are going to be satisfied first with his time and ministry, and then if there's any time left over. Right? He's saying everything the disciples are thinking, but she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs, what is she saying about herself? I acknowledge in one administration that people think that we are unclean. I acknowledge that. Even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Jesus said to her, wow, your faith is great. Through this discussion, Jesus establishes an opportunity for the woman to expose her faith in front of disciples that don't yet understand everything that faith is about. It's also interesting because through this, she is declaring what about herself? Because she has faith, who is she? She is a lost sheep the house of Israel. She has a place at the table. She is a child of God. So in this topsy-turvy, backwards, and sometimes the switcheroony that Jesus brings to the table, even his definition of what Israel is, is being challenged. And Israel becomes something more about what faith has than it is about where you were born or who your physical parents were. If that makes sense. So, let's finish this thing. Let's get to Matthew 15, verse 29. We're reaching the fourth of seven mountains. This is the central point of the entire book. If you just count verses, it's going to be a slightly earlier in chapter 15, but verses don't count well because verses were added later, right? They don't have the right number of, or an even number of words in each verse, and you're counting English words anyway. So really, when you want to find the center, you got to go to the Greek text, and that's our best guess. But this is the center. And what is it? I'm not going to review the whole thing, because we've already been through a feeding of the 5,000, and there's not a ton that's different here in this feeding. But let's, uh, when it comes to the center point of the entire book, I've suggested to you already several times that Matthew's main point in his book is to present Jesus as the new Moses. And I had to bring a book that I bought in preparation for writing uh, on my doctoral thesis, The New Moses. And this is a book where the author goes through the book of Matthew and lists all the different places where Matthew is bringing up typology, saying Jesus is like that character in the Old Testament. Look at the thickness of that book. It's thicker than Matthew itself. So Matthew, at the central point of his gospel, I'm just going to tell you, his point is that Jesus is greater than Moses. He is that new Moses character. But he's just not a Moses. He's greater than Moses. And how do we uh, get there? Well, uh, at the center of this gospel, what, what do we have? We've got a healing, and the crowd marveled at, as they saw Notice what they saw, the mute speaking, the crippled restored, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Those of you that know the story of Moses know that he had one complaint, even though he had been given several resources on God's behalf to go into Egypt. He'd be given a staff, magical little staff, right? But what was his main complaint? I am slow of speech. I don't talk good, right? And so, what was, Jesus, or what was God's response to Moses in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10? I have never been eloquent. And God, and the Lord said to him in verse 11, 
Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, Moses, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. I, the Lord, will give you the words to say. And here, in the central part of Matthew's Gospel, what we have is Jesus, who is taking the mute, those that don't have the words to say, and it is Jesus himself who is giving them the words to say. So Jesus, in the central part of this book, is fulfilling the role that God played in, Matthew, in Moses' ministry. He is the one giving the words to the mute. And how else is he like Moses? Well, in the feeding of the 4,000, we covered this in the feeding of the 5,000. Interestingly enough, this is in a Gentile land. It's in the part of the Decapolis. We learned that through Mark. And in the feeding of the 4,000, we have Jesus, like Moses, giving bread from heaven, but Jesus is the creator of that bread. And he's feeding not just the Jewish people, the feeding of the 5,000, but here in the Decapolis, the bread from heaven not just doesn't just fall on the land of Israel, it falls even in the Gentile world. And so the ministry of Jesus is like that of Moses, but it's better than that of Moses. And that's the central peak. That's the central mountain in the book that Matthew was working toward. Here we have a character that is like our Moses in the Old Testament, but he is so much better because he is very God himself. Let's pray. Dear God, thanks for uh, Matthew 15, getting to the middle and finding the gems therein. And I just pray that as uh, we've been challenged this week by some pretty pertinent things about tradition and about what comes out of our mouths, uh, that you would let us take uh, those thoughts with us that you would challenge us this week, catch us unexpected, and challenge us to be more like you. Challenge us to give up more of ourselves, to find the true value in who you are and be willing to give everything that we have. In Jesus' name, amen.